Now we've got Congressman Jamie Raskin. Thank you so much for taking the time. The pleasure is all mine, Brian. So we are in the midst of this doom loop that is Republicans trying to elect their own speaker. More and more Republicans are now recognizing how bad this looks for them in the House and trying to pin the blame on Democrats for their inability to elect a speaker of their own party, saying that all the Democrats joined with just a tiny little fraction of Republicans. And so because of that, Democrats should actually shoulder the blame here. Can I have your response to that? Well, first of all, um, Matt Gates and his group of, I don't know, eight or nine who managed to overthrow Kevin McCarthy um, did it under a rule that Kevin McCarthy promoted that we all opposed. He was the one who advanced the rule that one member at any point could move to vacate the chair. So uh, he's hoist on his own petard. I mean, he's a, a victim of his own terrible uh, rulemaking. And, you know, you, if you you live by extreme mega rules you die by extreme mega rules and um that's why he was overthrown i mean we have been consistent we have voted i think uh now it's 18 times maybe 19 times for hakeem jeffries for speaker we're democrats that's who we want we're not voting for kevin mccarthy or jim jordan or any of them i mean it may be that there is a pro-constitutionalist Republican we could support if we decided to do that in our caucus. I mean, if it came down to it, we would probably support Liz Cheney, because she, even though we disagree with her politics so much, we find her to be a champion of you know constitutional patriotism. Yeah, well, I think the fact that she's a champion for constitutional patriotism is the exact reason why she wouldn't be a suitable choice for Republicans. But, you know, Jim Jordan has lost multiple rounds for speaker and yet continued to plow ahead as if somehow that was a mandate for him to serve. So can you speak on the irony of Republicans writ large embracing election denialism only to now get stuck with the humiliation of having to deal with an election denier in their own conference? And he's in denial about the repeated election results from the House floor too. I mean, uh, he is following uh, the cult master himself, Donald Trump, in simply refusing to take no for an answer. Um, and it's as if, his ambitions for power and control trump everything else that's going on. It's more important to them than uh, aid to our besieged democratic allies in uh, Ukraine uh, and Israel. It's more important in getting humanitarian assistance to the civilians in Gaza. It's more important than keeping the government of the United States going. Um, and so, um, you know, we're telling them, come over and meet us in the middle for a bipartisan path forward. There are a lot of things we can work out, but it's not going to be by putting an insurrectionist in the speaker's chair. Someone who's overriding legislative agenda today is to ban abortion across the country. What does it say that when the Republican conference was forced to vote in public, Jim Jordan finished at the end of this whole charade with 194 votes, but when the subsequent private vote took place out of view of the bloodthirsty, rabid base, Jordan only garnered 86 votes, less than half. What did you take from that? Well, the, um, I think it confirmed the applause meter that we were registering on the House floor. Like when uh, uh, Hakeem Jeffries was nominated, there was enthusiastic, lusty applause from the Democrats, really cheering and feeling very good about his leadership. And even after uh, Jordan was nominated um, the first time, um, it was just completely lukewarm tepid applause. So you got to believe that there were some people who were voting yes in public because they didn't want to face the wrath and the retaliation and the reprisals of Fox News and the death threats and so on, uh, but were opposing him in private. Yeah, hopefully nobody relayed that information to Sean Hannity and his producers. Uh, Congressman, what are, and you alluded to this just a few moments ago, what are the implications of not having a speaker or a functioning house now in particular, given what we're seeing in Israel and Ukraine? I mean, the, you know, this is the U.S. House of Representatives. This is the house of the people. Um, you know, unlike the Senate, which is apportioned according to the states, each state getting two, uh, this is this is the best approximation and representation that we have of the American people. Um, and there are a number of functions that we have that are constitutionally assigned, like originating budgets. Um, but we're not doing it. 
And um, the clock is ticking on November 17th when we will either pass a budget, um, perhaps a continuing resolution or another budget, um, or the government will shut down. But we're, we're just lurching from crisis to crisis under the GOP. If the Republican Party is not ultimately able to land on some speaker, some permanent speaker, there has been the idea of Patrick McHenry Henry floated as, as an interim speaker. So do you think that the Constitution allows for Patrick McHenry or any interim speaker, for example, to be empowered to move legislation or budget bills or aid packages in that role? Well, the Article One of the Constitution says that each house may set and define the rules of its own proceedings. So um, we theoretically could set up, you know, an office in the House called moderator or MC or I suppose acting speaker pro tem. Um, the question is, who is the House? Um, can the House do that if the House doesn't have a speaker? And we're just in terra incognita. Nobody knows. I mean, as with so many other things during the Trump period of derangement and chaos, these are all cases of constitutional first impression. So if we were to pass legislation during that period, nobody really knows, you know, whether that could be challenged, who would have standing to challenge it? Would, would it be considered a non-justiciable political question? I mean, it raises, you know, a lot of serious legal problems. Um, also, um, McHenry himself has said, he would not stay on in a capacity that required him to bring legislation to the floor and exercise other powers that he does not see as contemplated by that office, which means we would go to whoever is next on Kevin McCarthy's list. And nobody's seen the list. It's a secret list. Well, who would be the arbiter of whether any legislation or any rules handed down without a speaker in place to hand them down is, is valid? Well, the parliamentarian would be the first cut at it. Um, you know, I imagine that the background constitutional rule is a majority could adopt rules or provisional rules or transitional rules. Um, you know, I suppose the argument can be made that when the Constitution departs from a simple majority rule and says that you need two thirds, for example, for the uh, you know, passing a constitutional amendment or two thirds to convict a president in impeachment trial, it specifies that departure from the general majority rule background presumption. The Supreme Court, for example, operates with a majority rule, although it's nowhere stated in the Constitution, they've just always done it. So I think that that would be a safe presumption. Um, but again, you know, the Constitution um invokes the existence of a speaker. And so one could query the legality of any legislation that we pass absent a speaker. So we just don't know. Um, and, you know, the chaos continues for at least another week. By the way, I, I, I've said, you know, we want Hakeem Jeffries. We think he's super well organized and somebody who really stands for the American people. But if they can't stomach voting for a Democrat, I hope that the moderate Republicans could find somebody like Liz Cheney or Mitt Romney or um, Angus King from Maine who we could gather consensus around and bring that person in. You know, we had alluded to this uh, a few minutes ago as well, but there have been those reports of Jim Jordan's allies threatening the wives, for example, of Republican holdouts. Can I have your response to that? You know, I think about January 6th uh, and the run up to it when um, there were tons of death threats and threats of political retaliation and threats of violence that were going to members of Congress. We saw what happened on January 6th. So if you don't renounce and denounce the kind of political violence we saw, then it's going to go from hang Mike Pence and where's Nancy to let's get Liz Cheney, let's get Adam Kinzinger, let's get the Democrats to eventually let's get you. Um, and so the, you know, I think the moderate Republicans have learned uh, a tough lesson over the last several days uh, about what the rest of us have been living through for a long time now. I think meme culture would suggest that this is the uh, the leopards eating faces party in action. Um, 
You know, the, the, the question I get more than any other question right now, as we've been um, living through all of this dysfunction in the House, is will any moderate Republicans recognize that dysfunction and defect by voting for Hakeem Jeffries? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that, you know, even the more moderate Republicans who are in a Biden district believe that would be the end of their career as Republicans. You know, I think that their suspicion is they would have to leave the Republican Party and become Democrats if they did that. Um, I know a lot of them feel much closer politically now to um, our political leadership than to Matt Gates and Jim Jordan and the rule or ruin faction of the mega right. But to your point, as you mentioned before, they can't really do anything in public because then they'll be at the, you know, at the mercy of the of the the, the Fox News machine and the House Freedom Caucus um, and and all of their tactics. And so that's why what we see in public is going to be a lot different than what we see in private. That's why we saw, you know, 194 Republicans vote for Jim Jordan in public. But then when it's a private ballot, uh, suddenly that support is cut down by more than half. Right. A lot of them may have just gone home, too. We, we saw some people leaving. We saw Daryl Issa just leave the floor for the airport. So a lot of them had just had enough. I mean, that doesn't speak much for your political coalition that people won't even stick around and vote for you. Yeah, almost, um, almost can't blame them. So uh, can, can I ask what your prediction will be in terms of what will happen with the Republican speakership? Um, I, I believe that um, they have a real political legitimacy crisis within um, the Republican conference. Um, you know, I'm somebody who happens to think that Jim Jordan was behind the overthrow of McCarthy and then also blockaded Steve Scalise. In other words, I think, you know, he had it in mind from the beginning that he was going to end up on top after all of these events took place. And so that hardcore right wing faction um, is um, something like a majority or a near majority at this point. Um, but the moderates have been empowered by this last process of saying no way. Um, and I just think they're incredibly divided. There's a lot of bitter, caustic feelings that are being harbored by the different factions. So maybe they could settle for somebody like Tom Cole, maybe they go back to McCarthy, but I think more likely they will stand by um, some kind of speaker pro tem arrangement with expanded powers. But that creates the question of the mystery speaker um, in training pro tem, uh, because nobody knows who that is. And uh, the Speaker of the House um, made a list. And theoretically, could have made a list ranked choice voting style of the entire membership of the House of Representatives. We don't know how far down it goes, but presumably there's at least a handful of them. Well, is there any worry that if Patrick McHenry, for example, is empowered for 30 or 60 or 90 days, that that will give someone like Jim Jordan the time to then work on all of those holdovers instead of just what we have right now, which is, you know, the momentum was slipping away from him and he didn't want to deal with the abject humiliation of losing vote after vote after vote, day after day after day. But then this different situation would kind of allow him to take his time and really exert pressure onto those holdouts. Is that a worry at all? Maybe. But of course, if you just say came right out and elected McHenry or another moderate, they can move to vacate the chair anyway. And at this point, since it's utter chaos and instability there, there's nothing that would stop them from doing it. Um, I, I think that um, Jordan has gotten his comeuppance by the last several days. And, you know, there are other things that were going on behind the scenes. A lot of people were talking about this George Clooney produced documentary about um, Jim Jordan that is out there that um, apparently is is going to expose exactly what happened in the um, the player abuse sex scandal sex abuse scandal from Ohio State. In general, what's your message to Americans who are watching this dysfunction play out and the chaos play out as they prepare to cast ballots for their elected officials, including their officials in the House, as we head into 2024? Well, look, I mean, we're dealing with a party now which has been involved in a violent insurrection against the union, an attempt to overthrow a presidential election, which Joe Biden won by more than 7 million votes in 306 to 232 in the Electoral College, has tried to shut down the government of the United States, 
um, has tried to default on the debt of the United States is talking about um, basically dismantling all federal regulation for clean air and clean water and climate progress and you name it. I mean, we're talking about a rule or ruin faction that wants power above all other things and doesn't have any vision for progress for the country. So I, you know, my message to people, uh, whenever they call me a liberal, I say, you're damn right. I'm a liberal. The heart of that word is liberty. And I'm a progressive because the heart of that word is progress. But these days, I'm very happy to call myself a conservative because unlike the party of nihilists, um, and insurrectionists. I want to conserve the land, the air, the water, the climate system, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Social Security Act, the Medicare Act, Medicaid, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, you name it. Everything that they want to tear down is everything that we want to conserve and make work that the American people have built up over the decades and centuries of progress that we've made. Perfectly put. Uh, I want to switch gears here to the oversight committee that you sit on. We've apparently got yet another smoking gun uh, from Republicans. This time, James Comer has come out with evidence of the crime that Joe Biden received a loan repayment from his brother in 2018. And of course, we we all know how famously powerful Joe Biden was in the year 2018. Uh, can I have your response to what I what I can only imagine is this uh, this a uh, high crime of receiving a loan repayment. Well, Brian, we thought they'd given the whole thing up after the first impeachment hearing yeah. um, when their own witnesses testified that there was not remotely sufficient evidence to justify an impeachment. They didn't even see evidence of a crime, much less an impeachable offense. So now they come back with this huge uh, stack of bank records. And the most that they can pull out of it is that Joe Biden um, repaid a bank loan that his brother got. Um, that's not a crime. That's not an offense. If anything, that's being a good brother. Um, you know, he's helping his family members out. You know, the, the the folly continues. Some reporter said to me today on the way in, you know, do you think if um, you guys agreed to have an, an acting speaker pro tem, you would demand that they end their impeachment inquiry towards Joe Biden. I said, we'd be doing them a favor at that point. They should be asking us if they can end it because it makes them look utterly absurd and ridiculous. Do you uh, think that there will still be an appetite after the after the disaster that was the first impeachment inquiry hearing that it'll continue forward? I mean, that's what the suggestion by James Comer coming out with this new smoking gun would, would, uh, would suggest. The big surprise was that it came out in the oversight committee because we had heard that they would be moving things from oversight to the Judiciary Committee. Maybe he negotiated to keep it in return for supporting Jordan for Speaker or something. I don't know exactly what happened. Uh, it's hard to know. But that that was a surprise to some people that they would still keep going within the Oversight Committee. It has definitely not gone well there. Yeah. Well, I think if the whole Jim Jordan vote has taught us anything, it's that there's no shortage of a humiliation fetish uh, among the Republican conference. Uh, let's finish off with this, uh, Congressman. How is your health? Well, thank you for asking. I, you know, I finished up my chemotherapy and um, I have done my cat scan. I've done my pet scan. I um, feel like I should do my dog scan. My dogs have been barking like crazy here. Um, but uh, and uh, right now there are no cancer cells. So I'm back in the land of the living, the healthy and you're sweet to ask. So I, I feel great. And I have got my energy back. And um, alas, the world is on fire. And uh, it's a very tough situation all over the world and we want to do whatever we can to help. Well, we're glad we have you back and glad for your health as well. So as always, thank you so much for taking the time. It's always great speaking with you. Thanks for having me. Great to be here.